webinar is on supporting the healthcare rainbow. This is part of our health equity mini series, which is co sponsored by the WSMA and the Washington Patient Safety Coalition. It's my pleasure to introduce today's guest speakers. Amish Dave is a rheumatologist at Virginia Mason and co chair of Proudly VM. He is a WSMA board member and alternate delegate from Washington State for the American Medical Association. He's also the chair of the Public Health Committee for King County Medical Society. Amy Etzel is the Bree Collaborative Implementation Manager. She provides technical assistance to delivery sites throughout Washington State on Bree Collaborative guideline implementation, particularly in the area of behavioral health integration. I know that you'll all join me in giving a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Dave and Amy today. Thanks so much, Jessica. So um, I'm really excited to talk about this topic and thank you for, to the Washington State Medical Association, WISMA, for inviting both Amy and I to speak today. Um, I'm going to start with just a, um, you know, some what I consider important talks, topics on the social determinants of health and then kind of move on from there into more LGBTQ focused areas. But, you know, our goal when we think about how healthcare workers can be engaged to focus on the social determinants of health a lot of those factors that we'll get into that impact patients' care is really on improving health equity and providing more patient-centered care by really understanding and addressing the underlying causes of poor health. And to that end, there's really been a focus recently on training physicians, nurses, and other allied healthcare workers on addressing the social determinants of health um, because it's found that these are key principles for promoting more equitable health outcomes for patients, families, and their communities. Um, when we next slide, please. When we look at the social determinants of health, these include a huge number of things, including looking at factors that affect the patient's economic stability, like their income, what type of debt and expenses they have, what type of medical bills they have, their neighborhood and their physical environment, including their housing, access to safe transportation and parks and playgrounds, a lot of that built community or built neighborhood area, education, including thinking about literacy what language a patient speaks in relation to their community, um, as well as their early childhood and higher education as well. Food, including whether patients have access to healthy options or whether they're going hungry in their community. Certainly a major issue today with COVID-19 and the economic issues that we're facing as a nation. And then also thinking about social integration and how well any one individual feels connected to their community, what type of support systems they have and whether they've been um, suffering from any form of discrimination or whether they're particular or unique stressors that they have. And then finally, we're often thinking about the healthcare system. And this is what we are all as healthcare providers or ancillary healthcare workers involved in, thinking about what type of health coverage a patient might have, what's their access to a provider and the provider's availability, whether their clinic and their provider provides um, appropriate linguistic and cultural competencies and as well as the quality of care that a patient's having. So all of these factors go into, um, maybe next slide, please. Um, all of these factors go into the social determinants of health. And the World Health Organization defines the social determinants of health as all of the conditions in which, a, in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age, and the wider set of forces and systems that are shaping the conditions of daily life. Um, and these forces and systems include economic policies and systems, development agendas, social norms, social policies, and political systems as well. Next slide. When we think about LGBTQ patients, um, you know, the social terms of health are huge and incredibly important. 56, according to Lambda uh, Legal and a survey that did on discrimination in over 5,000 um, LGBTQ patients, at least 56% of, of lesbian, gay, or bisexual respondents that visited a healthcare provider reported experiencing at least one type of discrimination, including um, being refused uh, needed care, a provider refusing to touch the patients, um, a provider using abusive language, or some sort of um, blame uh, that the patient felt uh, for their health status, um, or, the, or even in some cases, unfortunately, physical abuse. Um, and this, this is even higher for transgender and gender non-conforming respondents with at least 70% of patients reporting one of these experiences in a health, from a healthcare provider. And of course, this is really 
um, contrary to our goals in healthcare. And the World Health Organization really says that enjoy, um, enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being. And certainly if you feel discriminated against, it's really hard to either attain appropriate health or to enjoy the health that you have. Next slide. So in addition, um, and not surprisingly, LGBTQ individuals suffer from a lot of adverse aspects of the determinants of health, um, including stigma and discrimination. And this leads to a lot of health disparities. And LGBTQ uh, patients compared to the general population, not surprisingly, have higher rates of substance use, tobacco use, sexually transmitted infections, including HPV and HIV, higher rates of, of uh, incidence and prevalence of obesity, depression, suicide, as well as worsened outcomes from cancer. Um, and part of that also might be due to a fear of going to healthcare providers and a lack of necessary medical screenings, for example, screening for cancer, as well as a lack um, or, or fear of seeking medical or even mental health care. So the next slide, I just want to focus on um, some things that are, that are important for all, us all to keep in mind during this presentation. And this WISMA has asked us to talk a little bit about this today um, because of, of um, really a focus amongst um, WISMA members who felt like this education is so important. And so many of you have probably seen this in trainings. I know we at Virginia Mason do this in trainings. And if you have, Great. If you haven't, feel free to still join me um, in going through this. But I wanted to talk about SOGI, which is sexual orientation and gender identity. And when we think about SOGI, we're thinking about a bunch of different things. We're thinking about a patient in terms of the sex that they were assigned at birth, where they signed as female or male or intersex, meaning that they had a combination of male and female organs at birth. And then we're thinking about gender identity. And this, is, um, this can be defined very differently by the patient um, as female, male, genderqueer, non-binary, and for transgender patients, trans male or trans female. And then we think about sexual orientation in terms of um, what type of sexual preferences a patient might have. We think about patients who are bisexual, who are attracted to both men and women. Um, patients can identify just as queer. Um, patients can identify as lesbian or a woman who's attracted to other women. Pansexual, meaning they're sexually attracted to men, women, transgender persons, um, really a wide spectrum of different um, of gender identities. Um, patients who are gay are men attracted to men. And then pa patients who are um, identify as, quote, straight, or um, a man attracted to a woman, or a woman attracted to a man. And it's important to recognize that sexual orientation um, is variable and can change over time, and certainly is not something that is fixed. Um, and then there's gender expression, which is how a patient might express themselves, or how an individual expresses themselves is maybe more, quote, masculine or male acting or feminine, more female acting and more gender neutral. And I use these terms, but it's also important to recognize that um, different patients want, might want to be referred um, differently uh, in their gender expression. And it's, it's always helpful for us not to assume that a patient identifies or expresses themselves in any one way and when in doubt to ask. Next slide, please. And you know, one model of this is um, the genderbred person, which I think is pretty cute. And I included a link at the bottom of this, which is just for us all to identify, again, another way of thinking about gender identity, gender expression, biological sex, and who a patient is attracted to. I've often found that patients, um, you know, when having these conversations often feel more comfortable with some sort of a graphic um, especially if they're unsure about how they might express their, um, their gender expression or might describe their gender expression or their gender identity. Next slide, please. And then, you know, when we talk about what LGBTQIA means, we describe, um, you know, a lesbian woman as maybe one who is romantically, sexually, or emotionally attracted to women or female presenting people. Um, uh, um, a gay uh, uh, individual as a man who might be similarly sexually or romantically or emotionally attracted to a man or male presenting people. 
a bisexual individual is someone who is romantically, sexually, or emotionally attracted to two or more genders. Transgender individuals as um, a person whose gender identity differs from their sex at birth. Um, recognizing that transgender people can be, in terms of their um, sexual preferences um, or attraction, um, heterosexual, homosexual, or bisexual. Um, and it's important to recognize that not everyone whose appearance or behavior is gender atypical will identify as a transgender person. Um, and then the Q can stand for queer or questioning. Um, the I for intersex, again, those people who were born with a mix of characteristics, um, whether sexual, physical, or strictly genetic, or some combination of the above. Um, and then A for asexual or someone who's an ally. And the plus often refer is included as kind of a way of showing inclusivity and support for those people whose identi identities, labels, or experiences don't classically fall into any of the other letters. And it's always helpful to kind of ask and to refresh your memory by looking up these or even asking a patient their understanding of what, um, how they define themselves. Next slide, please. So to that end, Washington State Medical Association has tried to be a leader in um, recent years and really for a long time um, on these issues. And in 2019, Resolution C24, Improving Healthcare Experiences for Transgender and Gender Nonconforming Patients, um, really resolved that WISMA strongly supports the rights of transgender and gender nonconforming patients in accessing healthcare. But more specifically, um, WISMA has taken a stance that they want to ensure appropriate documentation of a patient's preferred name and pronouns as part of new patient registration processes that they want to establish and, and you know, ask healthcare centers to think about establishing and publicizing protocols for documenting a change in a patient's gender to provide maybe a write-in option for sex and gender on all forms and to avoid binary identifiers like just male or female. To offer some form of gender sensitivity training by someone who's expert at this um, for all medical providers, administrators, and support staff. To develop guidelines for pro providing appropriate preventive healthcare screenings for all patients, regardless of gender identity and according to a patient's physical needs. To provide adequate bathrooms that are gender neutral. And then if a, if a healthcare system or healthcare facility can't provide these to, uh, or can't provide particular services, to be able to provide referrals to patients for hormone replacement therapy or gender affirming surgical procedures or routine preventive health screening. All things that I would hope that, you know, in 2020 we identify as um, good models of care for our healthcare systems in Washington State. Next slide, please. And I'm really proud that it, it just last month, one of my resolutions passed the Washington State Medical Association. And this refers to the longstanding policy um, by the um, uh, both CDC and the FDA um, that limits uh, blood donation by men who have sex with men, um, really starting in the 80s and for many years until earlier this spring, there had been a lifetime deferm, uh, a ban on donation of blood that was later restricted, it later has been kind of whittled down over the years. And as of this spring, it's now down to three month deferral period. Um, and we are really advocating ultimately for ending and opposing a federal blanket deferral period on blood and tissue donations from men who have sex with men. The data really suggests that, um, uh, well, one, the CDC screens all blood donations that it receives um, for HIV and hepatitis C and other communicable diseases. And so blocking any one particular patient, uh, patient population from donating blood, um, especially when there's such a shortage of blood supply uh, today, really doesn't seem um, scientific or rational. And we're excited um, to hopefully in the future be able to work with blood banking organizations to educate prospective donors about the safety of blood donation and blood transfusion. Next slide, please. And then furthermore, um, this session also that the annual Washington State Medical Association conference just last month, um, a resolution that was brought forward by the medical student section um, really pushes WISMA and uh, to really take a stance on expanding the use of PrEP, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis to reduce HIV infection. We know that when PrEP is consistently used on a daily basis by patients who are, quote, high risk um, for sexual behavior that might lead to transmission of HIV, that there's more than a 92, some would say higher than a 95% um, prevention 
rate for HIV, um, and it might even be higher than that, uh, based on if, if a patient is consistently using PrEP each and every single day. One of the big problems re in recent years for a lot of patients is coverage by their insurance or their uh, carrier uh, for PrEP, or really high co-pays um, for Truvada and Descovy and some of the other um, options for PrEP. Um, and so we're really um, going to be advocating um, as a medical society um, for policy that supports PrEP for free or at reduced costs for uninsured individuals at high risk for HIV, and then also supporting full coverage of PrEP by commercial and public insurance options as preventive therapy. Next slide, please. So WISMA has developed um, a really wonderful toolkit that you can find online at the link at the very bottom of this slide. Um, to really provide comprehensive and culturally competent care for the LGBT community. And um, in case I was not clear, there's further descriptions of the terminology that can be used um, for LGBTQI patients. And then also some information on how to provide a safe and welcoming waiting room. And then further resources from national and local um, sources of good practice in LGBTQ care. And I'm gonna turn it over to Amy. Thank you, Dr. Dave. And thank you, Jessica, and thanks to WISMA for this opportunity to share the Brie Collaborative LGBTQ recommendation. I'm going to start with just a little background on the Brie Collaborative itself and our guideline development process. We are a public-private group in Washington State formed by our state legislature in 2011, funded by the Healthcare Authority. Our goal is to improve healthcare quality, outcomes, affordability, and equity throughout Washington State. Our collaborative members are appointed by our state governor and form a really diverse group of stakeholders across the healthcare landscape, representing health plans, public health care purchasers like our state Medicaid agency, and other purchasers such as Boeing and SEIU 775, as well as representatives from delivery systems across the state and other quality improvement organizations. We really aim to be a neutral convener among stakeholders that don't often sit at the same table together to try to tackle some of our larger healthcare system issues. Next slide. Every year we select four or five healthcare topics that have variation in delivery or outcomes that are used inappropriately or too often or that maybe are not used enough or that have a patient safety or equity issue that our community cannot address alone. Our recommendations are formed by clinical committee or work groups made up of community members with specialized expertise in that selected topic. And then this collection of volunteers meets for about nine to 12 months. These work groups review published literature, guidelines from specialty societies, the work of other quality improvement organizations, national entities, and then programs and policies within our own local delivery systems to produce a best practice guideline and recommendation. We then open this up to a public comment period to receive feedback from our larger healthcare community around the state. And then once the guideline has been finalized and adopted by the collaborative members, we submit it to the healthcare authority for final adoption. Our main implementation pathway previously has been through the healthcare authority who writes our recommendations into their state contracts. And then beyond this, our recommendations are pushed out and offered up to the broader healthcare community, although how or to what extent these are implemented has always been a little bit fuzzy. So I joined the, the collaborative in September of last year to put some dedicated efforts toward this implementation work. Next slide. So here is a list of all of the recommendations and reports we've produced. As you can see, we've worked on a really wide variety of topics, starting with obstetrics, looking at appropriate C-sections. We've also developed best practices for topics such as low back pain and end of life care. We try to select healthcare services annually that show inequitable utilization or that may be contributors to health disparities. The BRI also just started work this September on a social determinants of health project that will include strategies to assess and address health disparities, including from racism within and outside of clinical care. Next slide. Our lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer or questioning LGBTQ healthcare recommendation was adopted by our community in 2018. The collaborative really sought to further the goal of a healthcare system that allows everyone to have a fair opportunity to be healthier and acknowledged that LGBTQ people share common challenges and have healthcare needs distinct from those who do not identify as LGBTQ. These recommendations seek to align care delivery with existing evidence-based and culturally sensitive standards of care and to decrease health disparities overall. 
So each of our guidelines is generally framed around specific focus areas. And so our LGBTQ recommendation identified three focus areas to frame our recommendations around. And you can see these three focus areas up on the screen. Um, I'm going to dig into some of the specifics written into the guidelines in a little bit, as will Dr. Dave, who's really going to dig into how they play out in action in a clinical setting. But for now, I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Dave for a quick slide before we dig in. Yeah, and I, thank you so much, Amy. So, I, you know, I would also add that um, one of the things that a lot of healthcare systems have really been utilizing is the Human Rights Campaign Healthcare Equality Index, or the HRC HEI which is um, so far been an annual survey, although I've heard it might be a, a every two year survey coming up um, that promotes and encourages inclusive care for LGBTQ individuals at um, healthcare facilities across the US. In 2018, 626 healthcare facilities actively participated in the survey. And I haven't seen the most recent data on 2019 and how many um, healthcare facilities across the country um, participated, but I know it's been increased. This survey, really focuses on five different areas, including non-discrimination and staff training, patient services and support, um, what type of LGBTQ affirming employee benefits and policies exist, patient and community engagement and responsible citizenship. So if you're not sure if your healthcare system is involved in this, in the HRC um, HEI index, or if you're not sure um, what, what it all involves, I definitely recommend you go to their website and check out uh, more about it. And I'll turn it back to you, Amy. Great, next slide. So as part of the Breeze implementation efforts, I've been developing implementation resources or checklists for our recommendations. And so here on the screen is a, just a quick snapshot visual of our LGBTQ checklist for clinical staff outlining the three focus areas I mentioned and that we'll be diving into throughout the rest of the hour. I refer to these checklists as kind of like a cliff notes for our larger report, kind of a quick view of actionable items that staff can take toward implementation of the recommendation. I just also like to say we fully recognize recognize that, that not all of these steps are easily taken and or will take time to fully implement. And you all face such a variety of limitations within your clinics and our overall healthcare system around staff and budgets and time and reimbursements. And so what we've laid out here is really meant to be a pathway to full implementation and any progress down that path we consider truly success. Next slide. So let's dig into focus area number one, communication, language, and inclusive environment. The work group members really focused on developing a recommendation that's based on a whole person care approach that takes into consideration the multiple factors that inform health, wellness, and experiences. The actual items in this focus area are really some potentially easy wins that can have such a huge impact on the overall experience of the patient in making them feel comfortable and to start building that necessary trust with their provider and the clinical setting as a whole. So first off, it's really normalizing open and honest conversations with the patient around their preferred pronouns and sexual orientation. That's a sort of a first step goal and it really aids them in feeling comfortable within your environment. Um, another easy win could be updating your patient forms to allow for patient preferences around preferred pronouns, names, and gender identity, and it immediately tells the patient, my identity is respected, and, that, and then taking that a step further, updating your EHR systems to ensure that these preferences are maintained throughout the entirety of patient care. That's really important. Another potentially easy and quick action item that has a lasting impact on the overall patient experience and comfort levels are creating gender neutral bathrooms, staff badges that reflect pronouns, and then having marketing materials around the clinic that show same sex families. All of these efforts really say to your patient at every step of care, we see you and we respect you. Putting these recommendations into action obviously requires a basic level of buy-in from your staff. And so we do recommend having non-discrimination training for all staff on proper pronoun use and other respectful behavior to make sure that there's a really strong foundational knowledge base to achieve this goal of building trust and comfort with your patients. Okay, back to Dr. Dave to talk about how he and Virginia Mason has put this into action. Thank you so much. So you know, Virginia Mason has really been focused on improving um, what we call the, the Virginia Mason experience, which means increasing team member engagement and improving patient experiences 
so that patients feel valued and included and respected. And we decided a long time ago that that obviously has to also include our LGBTQ patients as well. So to that end, next slide. We um, created now almost four years ago, um, Proudly VM. So Proudly VM is our LGBTQ staff committee, um, which consists of Virginia Mason employees or who we call team members here, who are really focused on LGBTQ related health topics. Um, and I was really proud to be one of the co-chairs of that along with Camille Johnson and now Eleanor Holly is my co-chair here at Virginia Mason. And we also created around the same time a transgender service line that was focused specifically on the transgender population looking into improving access to both medical hormone therapy for transgender patients, as well as access to surgical therapy. And this really has fallen under Virginia Mason's larger initiatives called Respect for People, as well as our Health Equity Initiative. Next slide. So to that end, we've really been focused on a lot of different things that, um, with Proudly VM and at Virginia Mason. We're obviously always focused on recruiting a diverse range of providers and team members. We do that through a lot of press releases, through what we call our VNet internal communications at Virginia Mason. We do it also by being involved in community events, including Seattle Pride. Um, we've been participating in Seattle Pride in 2017, 2018, 2019 as a unified um, hospital system. And we of course, uh, would have participated this year as another platinum level sponsor uh, for Seattle Pride, um, but the pandemic of course canceled uh, Pride this summer. But we've tried to focus on you know, all of our team members wearing the same sort of t-shirt with a similar design so we can feel like there's a sense of a community. We've also been focused on um, uh, engaging our probably VM uh, members and our transgender service line team members in social events. And then really focusing on understanding and exploring coverage options for gender affirming surgeries through our own insurance policy at Virginia Mason, making sure, for example, that our first choice policy is covering items, uh, uh, surgeries and hormone therapy. And if it's not, finding out how we can get patients um, access to the appropriate care. And to that end, we've also been really focused on um, our score on the Human Rights Campaign HEI uh, survey and making sure that we understand where our score is. In the last couple of years, we've been at a score of 100, but the score, um, even though that sounds like a great score, there's always areas for improvement and we've been really focused on that. Next slide, please. Um, we've also been focused on non-discrimination training for all of our team members. So that includes for all team members who are hired. And then I believe that every two year interval, we initially had a system called HealthStream and now we have Miles Online Education where all patients need to do training, or I'm sorry, all team members, all of our employees need to do training on LGBTQ health. And that included an hour on just LGBTQ health and then an hour on transgender health. And then we had other specific modules for um, providers, including endocrinology and um, surgical surgeons who were providing more specialized um, transgender surgical care or hormone care um, uh, for, the, for, for uh, online training as well. Next slide, please. We also are working currently on a project to include what we call staff badge paddles, where uh, in addition to kind of the badge that they might wear, including their name um, and what department they're on, they can have another paddle on that badge um, that allows for patients to ask them what pronouns um, um, uh, we all use. And so um, we're hoping to implement this soon um, and uh, make it easier for patients to feel comfortable um, providing their own pronouns because we realize that, um, you know, unless we're inviting patients to be able to provide their pronouns, there might be a missed opportunity there. Next slide, please. Our efforts continue and we've been doing, we've been trying to also update our work appearance policy to be more inclusive of our workforce, um, including thinking about um, um, making sure that uh, we do specialized trainings and what we call respect for people, um, it, 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 which involves conversations that we have at Virginia Mason around the topics of inclusivity and how to deal with individuals who might be, including patients and other staff members who might be hostile or um, make inappropriate comments. Um, and so we're continuing to try to uh, do have these critical conversations at VM as well. Next slide, please. 
And we're also trying to include patients. And so we call our patients, um, we have a, a whole section called patient family partners. And we include patients who are particularly focused on LGBTQ care and design of that care within our guiding teams um, when we're thinking about um, policies and procedures that might affect this patient population. And that includes education, community outreach, um, co-design, as well as quality improvement efforts at VM. We've been really lucky um, that we have such great patient family partners who've been helping us with reviewing handouts, for example, that we might give out, as well as our websites on transgender care and LGBTQ care um, at Virginia Mason, so we can make sure that we're using the best terminology and so that we can make sure that we're not misrepresenting information that we're also up to date. But at that end, we've also tried to have, or we did have an innovation expo where our providers providing surgical and hormone therapy for transgender care met with community members um, last year. And at our internal orientation fair for all of the new residents who come to Virginia Mason, we've included conversations about LGBTQ care so that um, new, new residents um, can feel comfortable and know that probably VM and the transgender service line exist. Next slide, please. We've also been having more medical education. So we have Schwartz Rounds, which is national and conversations about the humanities in healthcare. And we did Schwartz Rounds just last fall in September, focusing on issues of bullying. And we invited patient family partners, team members, really all of our staff to attend. Um, and we tried to align this with National Coming Out Day and National Spirit Day, um, uh, focused on um, preventing teen, uh, teen bullying um, so that we could um, also recognize uh, what are considered to be LGBTQ holidays by the Human Rights Campaign. Next slide, please. Okay, back to me. Um, uh, before we get started, I think Jessica's gonna launch a poll to ask about current use that you all have around taking a social and sexual history. I think that should appear in a moment. There we go. So feel free to um, participate in that poll while I talk through focus area number two, screening and taking a social and sexual history. When we hear the word screening in the context of LGBTQ patient care, we tend to think first of cancer and STI screening. I really wanna call out that a big part of our recommendation includes behavioral health screening as well. The Bree and others around Washington State are huge advocates of integrated care between primary and behavioral health. And we recommend regular screening using a validated screening tool for behavioral health concerns, as well as screening for intimate partner violence and tobacco. As we've already discussed and evidence shows that LGBTQ persons experience elevated rates of depression, sexual abuse, smoking, and other substance use. In 2017, the Breed did complete a separate report on integrating behavioral health into primary care, and that report as well as supplemental implementation resources are available on our website. We recommend screening for behavioral health needs at least annually and at a minimum screening for depression, including for suicidal ideation using the ninth question of the PHQ-9 tool or the first question of the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale, and then also screening for anxiety using the GAD-7. And then depending on results, having a process to develop a plan for the patient as needed. We also recommend at least annual screening for alcohol and drug, mis drug misuse. The collaborative also has a recommendation report from 2014 on that topic. In the interest of time, I won't dive too far into these, but again, we have these resources and some recorded webinars around the SBIRT model and the use of motivational interviewing in the SBIRT also available on our website. And then moving on to taking a social history, it should include basic components of a sexual history. How you can ask these questions should be flexible and will vary based on your practice environment and the patient population. But within that flexibility and cultural sensitivity, we do recommend some clear clinical protocols defined for your staff. We recommend um, as a basic sexual history to ask some core questions about gender and sexual orientation of sexual partners, the types of sex that they are engaging in, as well as history of STIs and or concerns around STI risk that the patient may have. 
We also really recommend that providers receive training on taking a sexual history in a non-judgmental way and in a way that clearly explains to the patient the rationale behind asking some of these questions. So for example, when asking about the type of sex they're engaging in, identifying that the goal of this conversation is to identify anatomical sites to be tested, making it clear that you're in no way trying to be invasive. Our full report has further examples and resources on how to engage in these conversations and how to frame these questions. And then of course, as I mentioned, part of the core questions included in a basic sexual history, there should be discussion around STI history and any concerns the patient has about STI risk. We also recommend you configure your EHR system to have queryable data fields on gender or sex of sex partners to help promote and monitor standards of care around HIV and STI screening and PrEP use. And with that, um, we'll turn it back to Dr. Dave and launch the, po the poll results. So the question was, how often do you take a sexual history for your patients? And it looks like it's pretty well spread out across the board, 26% saying 76 to 100%, um, but the majority of you did say zero to 25%. So that's something that hopefully you can learn from Dr. Dave on going forward. Thanks so much, Amy. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, we probably have seen similar, we would probably, if we did a, a specific survey on how many, how often patient, uh, or providers are doing, taking a sexual history of Virginia Mason would see probably a very similar type of spread. Um, and this is this was actually one of our biggest issues when we first started Virginia Mason. Um, it was really educating our primary care providers about um, taking a sexual history on our patients and then assessing whether there were patients who might be good candidates uh, for PrEP. So. Let me get into that a little bit. So PrEP, again, is pre-exposure prophylaxis to prevent HIV, and studies have shown that it's at least 92% uh, effective in high-risk individuals. I would argue probably higher um, if patients are taking it consistently. Um, and we've always felt like PrEP should be offered through primary care um, providers and that um, it, it, patients should not have to see an infectious disease specialist or get a referral to another doctor, pay a separate copay for care that should just be routine and basic. And so we started working on that and we, with the goal of trying to make sure that um, our primary care providers all felt comfortable and competent at prescribing PrEP and identifying which patients would benefit most from PrEP. And this is, of course, also important because I, I think good um, primary care is also good business. And if you're able to provide PrEP to patients who want it, those patients uh, will value the care that you're providing them and they will come to see you in clinic. Um, and so we ultimately worked on developing what we call at Virginia Mason a clinical value stream, um, which is a set of standardized recommendations and guidelines that our primary care doctors supported and endorsed um, through what we call the best practices task force that reviews data and the literature um, when deciding on um, certain practices that our primary care doctors want to adopt. Um, and we've also been tracking our PrEP, um, our patients on PrEP through a database that we created with our Virginia Mason Center for Healthcare Improvement Science. So we can see how many patients are getting PrEP and whether um, those patients are PrEP or also getting routine and recommended per the CDC um, STI screenings at three month intervals. Next slide, please. But we also realized that like also you, you could talk about PrEP and create guidelines for people to do PrEP, but unless you educated people about PrEP and talk to them, um, talk to the primary care providers about PrEP and, and making sure the primary care providers were comfortable talking about it and talk, taking a sexual history, um, they wouldn't talk about PrEP with their patients. And so Dr. Camille Johnson, um, uh, my former co-chair at Proud BBM actually went to all of our regional medical centers, all of our clinics at Virginia Mason, worked with our residents, our gynecology group, to make sure that she could answer as many questions as possible uh, that people had about PrEP, about, and also questions about um, taking sexual history, questions about how to treat any sexually transmitted infections that a patient on PrEP or a patient not on PrEP uh, might have. We ended up also creating a series of videos to educate providers on how to take a sexual history and how to deal with awkward moments or awkward questions so that they would feel more comfortable. And we really tried to focus on the fact that asking people about a sexual history, um, who they're having sex with, how many partners they're having sex with, whether they've ever had an STI, to really do it in a non-judgmental manner. Next slide, please. We are constantly focused on trying to make improvements at VM, and some of it is easier than, than not. We use Cerner at Virginia Mason, and it's been a challenge um, editing Cerner and making it um, 
an electronic medical record that um, can more easily um, capture a patient's birth sex as well as their sexual orientation or their gender identity, or rather birth sex is re rather readily uh, captured, but the latter two less so. Um, we've been constantly working on trying to improve our patient spaces um, to make them more inclusive and welcoming through signage, working on signs of our bathrooms across the institution so that they're uh, not the usual male or female, but so that they're unisex or multisex. Um, in terms of signage and, and um, uh, comfort level for patients. We've also been focusing on designing telehealth services for hormone therapy for transgender patients. Um, and we've been really working on collecting basically a dashboard so that we can collect information from Cerner about all of our patients. We really wanna know how many transgender patients we have or not gender non-conforming patients, um, as well as gradually collecting data on how many of our patients are gay or lesbian, um, so we can have a sense of who is in our community and who, what, what, does our, what, what composes our patient population. Next slide, please. Thank you, Dr. Dave. Okay, um, now into our final focus area, areas requiring LGBTQ specific standards and systems of care. So this area is really mainly just calling out and defining specific care delivery areas where dedicated thought and really clear processes for your LGBTQ patients is needed. First, as we've mentioned, behavioral health screening is strongly recommended for this community. And then beyond the screening, we really wanna to try to develop a tracking system to monitor these scores and a clear process for following up with patients who have an identified behavioral health need. This may require um, some designated staff like care coordinators and or protecting time for other staff to achieve this goal. Another area that requires a good tracking system and or very clear referral processes, if not able to be offered on site, is PrEP and HIV treatment. Dr. Dave spoke to this so well earlier. Regarding other STI and HIV screening, for men who have sex with men and transgender persons, the work group identified following the Washington State Sexually Transmitted Disease Screening Guidelines as a good practice. So really making sure that all staff are up to date on these and that these recommendations are part of standard practice at your site. Also having a routine schedule for cervical and breast cancer screening and prostate cancer screening for transgender women is important. Evidence shows that lesbian women are less likely to undergo certain screenings for cancer, most notably uh, mammograms for breast cancer and a pap test for cervical cancer. And then we recommend talking with transgender women about regularly scheduled for prostate screening. The BRI also has a prostate cancer screening report out in 2015, should you need more information around that. We also recommend HPV immunization for patients, patients through age 26, but and recommend you monitor for change from national organizations on this one. And then a really important area to have clear and specific processes around if truly wanting to best serve your LGBTQ community is around the area of hormonal therapy and surgical care. Um, Dr. Dave spoke a little bit and he's going to get into this further, um, further on with far more expertise than I could give you. But what I really am trying to stress here and really for all of these specific areas, what I'm wanting to call out is really take the time to develop your processes and protocols and make sure that your staff are fully aware of them to best meet the needs of your patients. And then you see that asterisk associated with this focus area, sort of the overarching message for all of these called out specific areas is if you're not able to provide these services on site, be sure to have a good inventory of local resources and then, and I, I'll say it again, I think for the third time, I sound like a broken record, be sure that you have very clear and specific processes for referrals that all staff are fully aware of to ensure your patients are receiving the necessary care in these identified areas. And then finally, I wanna call out the importance of having members of the LGBTQ community on patient advisory boards and governing bodies. Um, we hear it more and more, and it's, it's even more important and vital in 2020, representation matters. You can have the most empathetic and non-judgmental people on your committees and boards, but without that lived experience to give an added layer of truth to the voice of their community, your committee's work may fall short. Okay, back to Dr. Dave to dig in further. Okay, so 
I'm, we've been really fortunate at Virginia Mason to have a transgender service line. And this was really important to improve the care of transgender individuals and um, uh, patients who are not uh, gender non-conforming at our hospital. And this is really through an integration of primary care, medicine, surgery, as well as our hospitalist team, um, as, as well as endocrinology and a whole bunch of other services. Next slide. Um, the goals of the transgender service line at Virginia Mason have really been to develop strategies to deliver gender affirming care to our patients in a respectful, respectful, valuable, safe, and consistent manner. We wanted to do this through the collective knowledge of our multidisciplinary teams and through community partnerships. And to that end, we've actually included a lot of transgender patient partners um, in because of their collective knowledge as well, and um, to work with our teams to uh, best meet the needs of this patient population. Um, and we've also been leveraging um, our experience with work that other groups do, like for example, Ingersoll, uh, which is to my understanding, the, the, the longest running um, transgender um, healthcare information group in the country. Um, and we've really benefited from their experience as well in the care of our patient population. Next slide. But it's impossible to really take care of a patient population unless you actually track the numbers of that patient population. We've tried to use in the recent past the diagnosis codes for gender dysphoria, which I know is a um, often a much aligned, mal uh, 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 mis misguided uh, term, but it's it's what we've had uh, to be able to track ICD codes uh, for patient visits, and and basically what we've seen is that we've been getting more patients um, with this diagnosis um, who have. Um, um, who are gender non-conforming um, or transgender over time. And we try to track this um, um, so that we get a sense again of who our patients are and so that we can understand what types of medical and surgical care they're getting um, or what type of services they want and why they're coming to Virginia Basin. Next slide. We've also been focusing again on understanding national best practices and local best practices by coordinating with Ingersoll, looking at what Fenway Health and UCSF recommend, and then working with specific primary care doctor leads like Dr. Camille Johnson, for example, of Virginia Mason, who's really become our local expert on hormone therapy, and then focusing on educating our insurance navigators, educating our team on the transgender service line about um, what insurances might cover and might not cover for surgical care for patients um, so we can understand um, what services we can provide and how to best coordinate with our patients. Next slide. And really what we want to do is be a local and eventually national leader in providing the full spectrum of medical and surgical treatments for gender affirming care for patients, or at least be able to tell our patients where to go if we don't provide certain options, like for example, certain bottom surgeries, which aren't routinely practiced or done, unfortunately, in Seattle right now, um, and also understand what type of barriers people are facing in terms of their insurances, whether they have a primary care provider who can help them, whether there's barriers because of a need for a mental health assessment before someone can start, say, hormone therapy or get um, a particular surgery, um, and also dealing with the fact that we have a deficit in the terms of the numbers of endocrinologists in Washington State, and often um, primary care providers might rely on their expertise or benefit, especially as they're starting to learn about uh, prescribing uh, hormones at adjusting doses over time, too. Next slide. So we've also been working on improving our patient education. I think if you click again, it should show a transgender info sheet um, on here. Um, this is, uh, uh, maybe if you click one more time, Jessica. Yep, there we go. So we've also been working with our patient family partners who are transgender so that we can constantly try to update um, information on insurance coverage and medical and surgical options at Virginia Mason. And to that end, it's also important to constantly look at what our competitors are providing. Um, so we understand, you know, what type of education is going out to patients, whether there's navigators who are helping transgender patients um, uh, get get uh, insurance coverage for a particular uh, surgical procedure. And then also are certain other institutions doing, for example, a CME day on transgender health or LGBTQ health and what can we do better and whether we can also keep up because it's important for us to provide medical care, but it's also important for us to provide education. Next slide, please. We really think it's important um, 
uh, to have our patients as partners and our patient family partner has been partnership program has been going on since 2013. And our goal really is to listen to the stories and experiences of our patients to understand the way that we're delivering care through their lens. We realize that we might not be doing everything well. In fact, we want to know when we're not doing well so that we can improve. Um, and certainly having our patients as part of our um, co-design efforts and as part of our team when we're thinking about any sort of quality improvement teams has helped us become, I think, a better institution over time. Next slide. This is almost certainly outdated. Um, this is from last year, but this kind of lists a series of what type of services that we provide at Virginia Mason and our goal and, and which services providing them. And our goal is to constantly try to update these and make sure that we have the services and um, that patients want to get, um, including our transgender patients. And also for us to understand what, what services might be provided um, at another hospital and healthcare institution. Um, and I always think back to like, is a miracle on 31st Street, and if you can't get something at Macy's and you can't at Gamble's, get it at Gamble's. And it's important for us to understand what other healthcare systems are providing so that if we can't provide a service to a patient or if the insurance doesn't allow a patient get a particular type of procedure at Virginia Mason for them to get it somewhere else. Next slide. So we are constantly tracking through our transgender service line dashboard, and this is from the spring of last year, what type of surgeries we're, uh, patients are getting, where, which of our regional medical centers transgender patients might be seen, um, and um, where we can do better. Next slide. And it's really important that we continue to be visible and we realize that as an institution. So I've been part of the Virginia Mason team um, 2017, 2018, 2019. We've been um, marching in Seattle Pride. Um, and last year we were platinum level sponsors for Pride, including the year before in 2018, which means that, you know, we do both the Saturday and Sunday of the weekend, I think in June, um, we end up uh, being out in Capitol Hill as well as um, by the key arena area, um, having a tent, having materials that we can hand out, and more importantly, having information and having friendly faces, friendly team members from Virginia Mason who are able to answer questions from people about the care that we provide, as well as questions about employment and questions about working at Virginia Mason. In fact, our t-shirts always have our logo on the front and then um, information about hiring on the back because we wanna make it clear that VM is a friendly place to work and that we want people who are LGBTQ uh, to feel comfortable applying to VM. Next slide. And our involvement isn't just about pride. We've also been carrying out external outreach to over 70 different organizations. I couldn't list every single place on this slide without the font being super, super tiny, but that means reaching out to places in Snohomish County, Kitsap, Pierce County, all over King County, and now kind of statewide. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's a little bit harder with COVID actually to schedule a million um, different Zoom calls and WebEx calls, but we've been trying um, through emails and reaching out to people and trying to stay on top of, um, of what activities a lot of these nonprofits um, have been doing as well as national organizations so that we can understand where our patients are and how we can do better. Next slide. And we've really been fortunate to be members of the Greater Seattle Business Association. For those of you guys who don't know, this is the largest LGBTQ and allied chamber of commerce in North America. And Virginia Mason has really benefited from being a part of the GSBA in terms of being able to um, uh, work with other businesses that are LGBTQ friendly, um, be, have our team members go to networking events as well, um, as well as just having the GSBA be a vocal voice for Virginia Mason. We're really grateful um, for this membership. Next slide. Thank you, Dr. Dave. Um, I just want to quickly highlight that, um, so I put a few resources that the Bree recommendation vetted and called out in our report here. This, um, this list is a list of resources that will also be found on the back page of the implementation checklist that will be sent out with the slides uh, to you. Um, maybe in the interest of time, I won't go through it in any of these. Feel free to look through them and reach out with any questions you may have about them. Excellent. Well, thank you both for that great presentation. Uh, we've got uh, quite a discussion going on in the Q&A box and then uh, folks are sharing questions and resources in the chat. 
Um, Dr. Dave, I'll direct uh, one question your way. There's a couple kind of related questions about if um, Virginia Mason's planning to hire a surgeon who does um, GAS, and then uh, will Virginia Mason plan on continuing to offer gender confirming care after the merger? Um, so my understanding is that Virginia Mason will continue to be providing um, gender affirming surgery. Um, I, you know, this is something that's certainly near and dear to me and important. Um, I have not heard anything to the contrary. Um, you know, I, I, I think we're um, excited about the merger with CHI and we're hopeful that it'll lead to better access actually to LGBTQ care. We're hoping that a lot of our practices at VM will be adopted elsewhere in the state. And so um, more to come. Um, and I, I don't specifically know about hiring um, um, uh, practices by surgery. I know that we're seeing a huge volume of people who want gender affirming surgeries. And I'm always someone who pushes for us to hire more surgeons and for us to look um, uh, at access. I think one of the big challenges with COVID has certainly been a lot of people avoiding surgery right now um, for various reasons. And so that might lead to a temporary delay in hiring. And my hope is over time um, with our patient population oh. so that we will be hiring more. Excellent, thank you. Um, the audio was dropping off just a little bit, Dr. Dabe. Um, there's there's a conversation about um, uh, alternative ways to name a women's health service line. Um, I threw in a couple suggestions, but Dr. Dave, I'd love to hear if you've heard of others. So um, other places we've heard of pelvic health, fertility, uh, family planning services. Uh, do you have any other recommendations? Yeah, I've also heard like comprehensive care. Um, clinics um, as well, and, and certainly just all the ones that you just named. Um, I, I'm, you know, I, I'll often say I'm not, I'm not always the expert on this, and so I, I definitely welcome um, the thoughts of our transgender patients. And um, I don't actually, I know that we, we often just refer to things as gynecology clinic or urology clinic, um, hopefully to avoid. Um, the use of maybe more gender, genderizing terms. Excellent, thank you. Well, it's the top of the hour. There are a few more questions, but what we've committed to do is uh, type up responses and we'll include those in uh, the follow-up email that will go out either later today or early on Monday.